Hi girls, Miss Gaska here. Today I'm going to go over English 3, Semester 1, Week 2, Activity 1.8, Researching Images of America. Our learning targets for this activity are to analyze the use of imagery in a poem and a visual text, and to investigate and explain the historical significance behind an iconic American image. So in this activity, we're going to be reading a poem and analyzing iconic American images to expand our thinking about an idea and reality of America. I want you to take a moment and look at this literary term on the side, imagery. Imagery is the descriptive language authors use to create word pictures. Writers create imagery through words and details that appeal to one or more of the five senses. So I want you to pay attention to that it creates word pictures and that it appeals to one or more of the five senses, okay? So setting a purpose for reading. I always consider this part of the um, springboard activity to be very important because it tells us what we need to be looking for as we read and that in turn is going to help us when we go to answer our questions. So to begin with, it wants us to underline words and phrases that evoke images. So we're looking for words and phrases that evoke images. So that basically means puts an image in your head. Then it wants us to notate the types of Americans mentioned. Then it wants us to put an exclamation mark, exclamation, explanation mark, next to shifts in narrator or perspective. I'm not sure what an explanation mark is. Or, I'm sorry. <laughs> explanation mark. Uh, and circle unknown words and phrases to um, try to determine what they mean by using context, clues, word parts, or a dictionary. So, let's look at this poem, Let America Be America Again by Langston Hughes. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain seeking a home where he himself is free. So that's the first stanza. I'm gonna be looking for images, the types of Americans, shifts in narrator or perspective, unknown words and phrases. So for one, I wanna note that pioneer on the plain kind of gives me an image. I could see a pioneer uh, in like an empty plain. And also I'm going to put, um, that this is a specific type of person that they're mentioning, which is something that we were going to be looking at. Notate. Pioneer. America never was America to me. So this sounds like a voice responding to the first part, because it says, let America be America again like it's coming from somebody who thinks America has always been America. And then here it says, America never was America to me. So this could be a response to the first stanza. So I think that's what they mean by shift in perspective. So I'm gonna put an explanation, exclamation. I'm, isn't it called an exclamation mark? So um, yeah, I was right on that earlier. Let America be the dream that dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. So man be crushed kind of gives me a mental image because I can imagine somebody being crushed. And then here we have that shift in perspective again that says it w never was America to me. So here it also talks about another type of person, kings and tyrants. And a tyrant is like a dictator, it's somebody that controls everything. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath. But opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. So I think the part about crowning with a wreath, we could kind of imagine. And then here we have another instance of um, another perspective speaking. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? 
So now we have the main poem perspective speaking to the other perspective. So this means that when we get the reply right here, now it's switched to the main poem being about that other perspective that's previously been in um, parentheses. So it says, I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. So we have another type of person, poor white. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. So we have a uh, Negro. I am the red man driven from the land. They're talking about Native Americans, red man. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek. Immigrant. And finding only that same old stupid plan of dog eat dog of mighty crush the weak. I think that in that paragraph we see some imagery with things like bearing slavery scars. That kind of gives an image in my head. I also um, see imagery with mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope. So um, this is a young man. Tangled in that ancient endless chain of profit, power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the men, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. So here we have a lot of um, powerful expressions, but I can imagine this chain that they're talked about that's being tangled in. Of profit, power, gain, of grab of land, grab the gold, grab... The like, you see somebody just like grabbing everything. Like they're taking everything that it takes to succeed. So um, then it says, I am the farmer, bondsman to the soul, or soil, sorry. So here we have uh, the farmer. I am the worker sold to the machine. The worker. I am the Negro servant to you all. So we have the Negro again. I am the people, humble, hungry, mean. And here we have all the people that are experiencing this. Hungry yet today, despite the dream. Beaten yet today, oh pioneers, I am the man who never got ahead. The poorest worker bartered through the years. The man who never got ahead. Yet I'm the one who dreamt our basic dream in the old world while still a serf of kings who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true, that even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone, in every furrow turned, that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home, for I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's glass grassy lee and torn from black Africa's strand I came to build a homeland of the free. So here we have um, the Irish, we have the Polish, the English. And here we have um, Africans, African Americans. So um, we also want to look at the imagery here. We have um, every brick and stone, every furrow turned. We have sailed those early seas, dark Ireland. Here we have grassy lee, torn from black Africa's strand. So we have a lot of strong images here of different places in the world. The free? Who said the free? Not me. Surely not me. The millions on relief today? The millions shot down when we strike? The millions who have nothing for our pay? For all the dreams we've dreamed, and all the songs we've sung, and all the hopes we've held, and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay, except the dream that's almost dead today. So he's saying here that the millions on relief today, that means like welfare, um, government assistance. Um, the million shot down when we strike. So those are the people in countries we go to war with. 
the millions who have nothing for our pay. So people who work all the time to pay bills and not have anything to enjoy. And then um, we have, oh, let America be America again. The land that has never been yet, and yet must be. The land where every man is free. The land that's mine. The poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me. Who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain, must bring back our mighty dream again. So here he names um, some of the groups that he had been uh, talking about before. The poor man, the Indian, the Negro, etc. Um, and then we have some images here with sweat and blood. Hand at the foundry, plow in the rain. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. So here we have the steel of freedom, which makes me think of like a sword. From those who live like leeches on the people's lives. I can imagine the leeches. We must take back our land again. America. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath. America will be. Out of the wreck and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plain. All, all the stretch of these great green states. And make America again. So we have rack and ruin of our gangster death. Like, that's pretty, pretty descriptive. And here we have a lot of description too. And then we have picture of like the different lands and everything like that. The stretch of those great green states. Like these, all these images are like really powerful and standing out. We have a lot of instances of imagery here. It's really a great poem, really powerful message about the things that America should be instead of what America is. So now for number one, it says generate a list of the types of people represented in the poem by those who mumble in the dark. What do the groups have in common? So go back to the part where it says, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And the part after that, where he says everybody who he represents. And that's where you'll find your instance. And then you'll um, have to answer as well, what do those groups have in common? Then for number two, who is speaking the words in the parentheses? And how is that voice different from the voice speaking in lines one through 18? What points of view are expressed by the two voices? So one voice has one opinion and one voice has a different opinion. So you're looking for how those voices differ from one another, all right? Number three says, what idea about America is Hughes trying to convey by including the image of the steel of freedom and the leeches on people's lives? So think about steel of freedom. Before I said it sounded kind of like a sword. What does that mean? Like, if, if freedom was a sword or freedom was something like steel, what do you know about steel that tells you about freedom? Um, what about the fact that steel is so strong? Something that can't bend, something that can't be, um, you know, can't be flexible to meet people's demands. It has to be strong. It, there's like a line. Um, and then leeches on people's lives. Think about what a leech is and then what leeches they're referring to there. For number four, it says, how does the change in tone at the end affect the overall impact of the poem? And why do you think the poet ended the poem that way? So look at the tone toward the beginning, the tone toward the middle, and then the tone toward the end and explain how that affected the impact of the poem and as well as why you think the poet decided to end it that way. For check your understanding, it says, for you, what was the most powerful image in the poem? What made it powerful? What point was Hughes trying to make by using this image? So go back and look at the various images that we selected and pick the one that you think is the strongest and explain why you think it was the strongest. What made it powerful? What was Hughes trying to say when he described it in that way? So setting a purpose for viewing. So this is kind of like setting a purpose for reading, but instead we're viewing. So some images have become a part of the story of the United States of America. Photographs from an event or of a person often capture some of the essence of what it is to be an American. What makes some images more iconic than the rest is the impact they have on the person viewing the image. There is a point at which an image has a strong enough impact that it becomes a part of our national story and collective memory. So Robert Harriman and John Lewis Lucate defined the term iconic image in their article, Performing Civ 
uh, civic identity, the iconic photograph of the flag raising on uh, Iwo Jima, iconic photographs are widely recognized as representations of significant historical events, activate strong emotional response, and are reproduced across a range of media, genres, or topics. So that's what an iconic image is. Think about icons. An iconic person or thing is something that's famous and well-known and believed to represent a particular idea. The Statue of Liberty is an iconic image representing freedom. So here's the picture of the American Marines raising a flag on Mount Suribachi, Iwo Jima in 1945, which was at the end of World War II. So explain from explain the strong emotional response that this image activates. What makes it an iconic American image? So when you see that image, what do you think of? What emotional response do you have, if any? Um, and then jot that down. And then what makes it, do you think, an iconic American image? Something that's just purely American. Then for number six, it says revisit your vocabulary tree and add details to your working definition of what it means to be an American. So... I might say that this kind of represents to me working together as a team because like they're all working to put the flag up, maybe pride because they don't have to put the flag up, but they choose to anyway because they're proud of it and they, you know, they want it to fly. Um, so maybe I might add that being an American means like working together and being proud of being an American. So now for the research review. So we're going to be reviewing your fam uh, familiarity, or you're going to need to review your familiarity with primary and secondary sources. Because for the essay that you're going to write for Embedded Assessment 1, explaining your definition is central. The sources should support your explanation. So primary sources are original documents containing firsthand information about a subject, like letters, diaries, things like that. A secondary source is a discussion or commentary about primary sources. So for instance, you could say that an image um, at a museum, like a painting or a picture or something like that, is a primary source. But the commentary that's often displayed on the side of the painting would be your secondary source because it explains things about the author, things about painting, etc. So to ensure that you use substantial, accurate, and timely sources to support your position, it's important to consider each source's validity, meaning if it's true or not, reliability, and relevancy, meaning like, does it actually support what it is that you're trying to say? So here's those three things uh, broken down. Validity. Does the information appear to be accurate and well-documented? Is there a bibliography or list of sources? Does the information appear to be free from bias or does it present only a single position? So when it says free from bias, it means avoid being opinionated, avoid, uh, avoid joining one side or the other. Reliability. Are the author's name and qualifications clearly identified? So you want to make sure that the author who wrote it is actually identified qualified to talk about that topic. If you were to um, read a scientific journal, for example, you might want your source to be a scientist or somebody from a well-recognized scientific institution. You don't want it to be Larry down the street. So is the information from a respected institution like a university? If it's an online resource, is the site listed as .gov, .edu, or .org rather than .com? So you'll find that .gov and .edu are particularly reliable sources. .org, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. It just really depends. And then relevance. Is the information closely related to your topic? Does it offer support with facts or other information you can quote to support your position? So, researching iconic American images. So what you have to do is research and find your own idea of an iconic American image. You will submit an image for your classroom's Gallery of America and provide an explanation of your choice to share it with your fellow students. So we're going to be posting your images on Edmodo so that you'll be able to share them with one another. 
Then as you think about what iconic American image you will add to the classroom gallery, revisit your vocabulary tree and the images you highlighted in the poem. With a partner, brainstorm a list, well, not with a partner, alone, brainstorm a list of significant events that you could remember from history, news, or life. So you might wanna jot those down here in the my notes section. Then as you research your iconic American image, keep in mind the three elements of significant images. One, the image is widely recognized as representative of a significant historical event. Two, the image evokes strong emotional responses. And three, the image has been reproduced across a range of media, genres, or topics. So those are the three things you're gonna keep in mind when you're finding your image. Then selecting a topic. Select one or two items on your list and expand your thinking with some notes on what you already know about the topic. Consider these questions as you think about your topics. How is this topic historically relevant for most Americans? What keywords are associated with this topic? Select one topic as the subject of your gallery submission and begin your research. So that's selecting a topic. Researching your image. Pictures are everywhere, on the internet, in print media, and in history books. Internet images searches can be so refined, or can be refined to locate black and white images, color images, fine art, and so on. Where will you find the most useful information? Use the ideas and keywords that you have generated to guide your review of reliable sources. Print a copy of your local image and create a plaque with a description, title, and photographic credit. Now, you don't have to print anything, but when it says create a plaque, you can um, go in and edit your picture in something like PowerPoint, something like that, in order to write the title of it, some details about it to describe it, and then the photographic credit, meaning like the person who took the photo. So here um, you need to fill out each of these different information, like your image, like what's the title of your image, when was this image created, why is it iconic, so like why is it something that's important to American history, why did you choose this image? And then, um, you don't have to prepare a presentation of your image, you just have to post it on Edmodo along with the details about it um, and why you chose it. And then what we're going to do is move down to check your understanding. So review the images that get posted and select two images you would add to the permanent exhibit of Ameri iconic American images. So write your choices and reasons for your selection on a feedback card. So that's all there is for this activity. I will see you in our next activity, which is 1.10. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.